the murky swamps of North Australia are in trouble. But help is at hand. Their exotic inhabitants have great friends. A few larger-than-life characters do their best to protect this wilderness. Travelling into remote and hostile zones to do their work. Also in trouble, an ancient culture at risk of dying out. Yet everywhere, a single goal, to teach, protect, share and understand. With its vast spaces and huge challenges, it's an ultimate journey. Not many people wrestle crocodiles, or at least live to tell the tale. Bob Bredel has a rare knack with all animals. Hello, Mom. And an enthusiasm that matches his sense of humor. <laughs> his passion for Australia's wildlife knows no bounds, from the scariest to Australia's darling, the koala. Hello, Richie. How are you this morning? Every morning at the zoo in Airlie Beach, Queensland, these little guys wait patiently for their breakfast. They're picky eaters. They'll eat one dish and one dish only. Eucalyptus leaves. Rob loves debunking myths about animals, starting with whether to cuddle koalas. Many people say animals don't like being touched. Well, we give the animal the choice. If he didn't like being touched, he wouldn't come, he would stay away. So you can see, he doesn't matter, he doesn't mind. He likes it. Bang goes myth one. The word koala, it is supposed to be an Aboriginal word, I do believe it is, but I don't believe the meaning. They say it means no water in English because koalas don't drink. Think about it, if koalas don't drink, he wouldn't know how to drink. You see, I'll give him a drink now. There you go. And bang goes myth too. As I said, if he didn't drink, he wouldn't know how to drink. He's drinking. You're going to be happy about that, aren't you? Eh? What Rob worry. wants is for visitors to make yeah. contact, <laughs> literally. But the main aim of the zoo is still to let people to get very close. Because I find that most people, if they wish to look at something, they say, oh, can I have a look? and they look with their fingers. So people love to touch things. I do. The animal's welfare is always his first consideration though. This koala, Richie, needs more space. Tomorrow is his lucky day. He's going to see his new home. No longer a small cage. Cuddling a koala is one thing, but Rob's hands-on style doesn't stop there. Here we have a poison snake. Now this particular snake is six times more deadly than a rattlesnake. And if he was to bite me and put the venom in the vein, I would have three seconds to live. Rob stays safe because he sees things from the tiger snake's perspective. To this snake, I am around eight tons. He is not going to come to me and bite me on the foot. The only way to get bitten by a snake is to stand on it, try to catch it, or try to kill it. And then it's afraid for its life, that's all it is. To a snake, that's second nature. See, my family and myself, we've had more than 200 years of playing with animals of the wilderness, so we understand these things just a tiny bit. Rob's theory is that if you understand animals and their behavior, there's no need to be scared. That doesn't mean that you can be careless, though. Complacency can kill. He reached me, and then he'll actually have a look, see? On the mouth there, where he thinks he can actually reach. Imagine you own the only pub in town and everybody must drink at your pub. 
and you happen to eat people. Every month, when you got hungry, would you start running down the roads looking for people? No, you wait for them to come to you. And all we've done with the crocodiles is use their instincts to our advantage, actually. That's all we've done. Come on, back over this way. Crocodiles are not very clever. They've been around for a long time, but they have no brain. In fact, this crocodile has a brain so big. That's it. So we're working with almost total instinct. And that's what makes them so easy to work with. If you understand the animal, you must understand it, though. Look at the size of the feet here. Some people say they can run fast, but just look at these feet. They're so small, they really can't. He's 300 kilos, and look at the size of these legs compared to mine. So they can't run at all, even though they say they can. I can sit here is because I'm sitting in the middle of the crocodile, and when he moves, I'm in the place that's not moving. He can't bite his feet, so I'm quite safe. It's the only safe place for a big crocodile, is right in the middle of his back, basically. But don't try this at home with your own crocodile, OK? <laughs> you must be a professional to do this, you know, wrestle the crocodile. He doesn't work on instinct. He works with it. Now, many people say you fed him before you played with him. He's not hungry, but that's not true. I'm going to feed him now to show you he is hungry. Now, before I walk past him, I have a stick, a big stick. So I touch him, that'll make him close his eyes. So then I can walk past him because he is using his eyes for hunting. Now I'll see if he'll snap his jaw, he might. Snap. But I can still put my hand inside of his mouth because it's not moving. If I move it, he snaps. Now watch. If I put it in his mouth, watch the difference. Now what's important about this crocodile also, this one is a wild crocodile. He was captured just 16 years ago from the wilderness. He must enjoy this. Hear the burp? Mm. <laughs> the crocodile's instincts serve it very well in the wild. In the rainy season, Kakadu National Park, which lies a thousand kilometers north of Rob Zoo, turns into a gigantic wetland. This is monsoon territory. 90% of the annual rainfall happens between November and April. The rains transform huge dry grass plains into massive lakes dotted with thousands of water lilies. All seems quiet, peaceful, and serene. But in the murky depths, ancient killers patrol the swamps. Saltwater crocodiles. There are 10,000 of them here, more than anywhere else in Australia. Unchanged for millions of years, they are living relics, leftovers from the age of the dinosaurs, thanks in part to that basic instinct. It just goes to show that you don't have to be smart to be successful. In today's world, though, even crocodiles need help to survive. Park ranger Russell Kubila has made it his life's mission to protect this area. With his water testing equipment always close at hand, he navigates the Yellow River several times a week. Breeding crocodiles love to nest in the saltwater mangrove forests. Russell picks his way through the tangle of waterways and tributaries, scanning the submerged roots for telltale silhouettes. These crocodiles, or salties as they're called locally, 
were once hunted almost to extinction. Since the early 1970s, they have been protected. Their numbers then recovered, but to such an extent that they have now, unfortunately, become a pest. The problem here is that we've got very large salties that live in this waterways, and um, they're pretty unpredictable. And uh, that's the perfect environment like that, where you've got a lot of aquatic weeds. Um, they can camouflage themselves very well, and uh, some of these crocs are in the order of six to seven metres, can be. And they weigh in, after about the four metre mark, they can get into about a, way up to about a tonne. So these are incredibly strong animals. And uh, you've got to be very careful around the riverway. What I'm doing now is just getting a bit of water through that net. And I'm going to sift it out. What I find in there, if there's any sort of little twigs and things like that, I'll put it in here. Russell constantly monitors the salinity of the waters here to make sure that they're healthy for wildlife. The smallest imbalance can have severe environmental consequences. We can get a good, better idea what's in the water. But checking salinity levels isn't the only concern that Russell and rangers in Kakadu have. They keep a close watch on invader species like cane toads and weeds like olive hymenanchi. In Australia's delicate ecosystem, any significant change can be an indication of a potential ecological disaster looming. But the rangers can't ignore their daily duties towards the thousands of visitors either. This can be anything from answering a few questions to leading tour groups through the flooded forests. The satisfaction you get by coming out here on the boat trips is that you're going to see a lot of wildlife, you're going to see uh, an experience, a, a, a very good um, environment where you know, it's a nice, pleasant way of coming out and seeing the, the countryside. Instead of being in a car, you're now floating sometimes in a large boat. Uh, ideally, it is better to get out here on the boat to see a lot of the a different side of the country here in Kakadu. Tourists flock to Kakadu National Park to see Australia's famous giant saltwater crocodiles. A sighting is almost guaranteed, and the salties sit obligingly still to have their portraits taken. You expect to see crocodiles living here, but the next resident is more of a surprise. Wild horses, or brumbies, wade through the swamps. In the 19th century, the settlers brought horses with them to Australia to work on the farms. Some of the descendants of these domestic horses either escaped or were let loose into the wild, and they quickly adapted to life in the waterways, thriving on water lilies and other marshy plants. They now blend into the Kakadu landscape as much as any native wildlife. Kakadu National Park stretches more than 100 kilometers from east to west and nearly 200 kilometers from north to south. It's nearly half the size of Switzerland. Russell must travel by helicopter to collect his next visitor. It's a great way to see some of the varied landforms and environments in Kakadu. As well as the floodplains and tidal flats, the park also boasts four major river systems escarpments and stony expanses, lowlands, hills, and basins. All of which this woman needs to know more about. Melanie Rickerman works for the Northern Territory Tourism Board she needs up-to-date, first-hand experience of the park, and Russell has come to show her around. Let's go. It's the end of the rainy season, and the road is still closed to tourists. Melanie and Russell have special permission to travel through. Well, we have to go through that. Melanie needs to see the damage caused by a recent cyclone 
and how this might impact on tourism to the area. So this cyclone really does um, have a big impact on the park and uh, there's been a lot of clean-up work during um, these last two weeks and you can see still by the, the looks of things, on, trees on the roads, uh, we've still got a big job on our hands. So probably about a, another month or so we'd have this road fairly cleaned up and a lot of our visitors can come back um, and enjoy the, this side of the park. From the air, the true scale of the destruction is clear. In some areas, gale force winds of up to 160 kilometers an hour flattened every single tree. Russell and his staff need to restore access to visitor sites and help local tourism businesses get started again. But it'll cost time and money. A lot of these areas and it'll take some time, almost in the order of about another month. The whole of Kakadu has been a World Heritage Site since 1992 because of its outstanding natural value. How much damage the cyclone has caused to the rest of the park remains to be seen. For now though, it's closed to tourists. Elsewhere though, a unique opportunity awaits. Aboriginal people welcome their visitors with an ancient traditional dance. At the heart of their culture, Ullaroo, or Ayers Rock, a sandstone formation 348 meters high, a magical place of myth and legend. To find out more about a culture thousands of years old, Anya is on her way to Tichakala, only three hours drive from Alice Springs. The red sands and open spaces lend a feeling of Lawrence of Arabia, complete with wild camels. Two centuries ago, settlers shipped these pack animals to Australia. Today, the country boasts the world's largest population of feral camels and the only herd of wild dromedary, or one-humped camels. Leaving the camels to their browsing, Anya pushes on deeper still into the vast, desolate outback. Finally, a hint of civilization. As Anya pulls into the service station, the attendant is already waiting, having seen the car's dust cloud ages ago. If there is one rule you don't break when traveling in the outback, it's filling up at every chance you get. You never know when the next one will come. This is also her last chance to stock up on supplies. There won't be any chilled refreshments where she's going next. Because Anya will spend the next few days in an Aboriginal settlement in order to find out more about this ancient culture. She's excited, but her first impressions still shock her. The poverty is instantly apparent. Hello, my name is Anya. Hello, pleased to meet you. Hello, hey, Steve. <laughs> The village elder, Johnny, and camp manager, Steve, are expecting her. This unique project was their brainchild. The main object here is a cultural exchange so that people from overseas or somewhere in Australia can come here and experience cultural interaction with people from Tichikala and learn to respect the traditional culture. Um, Johnny is here to represent some people from Tichikala. It's a hard life. Dust, flies, mosquitoes. Everything is happening in the rain, a strong wind comes, and you can live by it. You can understand how you live, making fries to hinder fries to live, to earn things that we can live on it. Given the harsh living conditions, Anya's camp seems luxurious. Half of the fee that tourists pay goes directly to the villagers. Next morning, she goes walkabout with a few of the villagers. They want her to taste a local delicacy. 
Where you find them? Under the tree? Yeah. Is, it, is it over there? Yeah. Okay, then, then you look now for more. After scratching at the ground to reach the shallow roots, Anya's guide, Maggie, finally finds her wild treat. It's a witchetty grub. Anya knows that she's going to have to be adventurous. She throws herself into the search and soon finds grubs to add to the collection. What's going to happen next? What you do with the worms? Yeah. You think so? After knocking up a small fire, Maggie toasts the witchetty grubs on warm ashes until they're al dente. In a world where food is scarce, this bush tucker offers precious free protein, especially for the growing children. I should eat it? Mm-hmm. You think I should do it? What does it taste like? A mixture of eggs and prawns. But Anya isn't convinced. You want to eat the rest? Luckily, the children aren't so fussy. You want to eat it? Oh, who's going to eat it? While Anya learns to forage for witchetty grubs, the saltwater crocodiles patrol the swamplands for much larger prey. The rainy season heralds breeding time for the saltwater crocodiles. They breed so fast that in the Northern Territory, crocodiles outnumber people by three to one. It's quite amazing then that on average, crocodiles kill just one person every year. Attacks always hit the headlines. In the past, the skin of saltwater crocodiles was worth so much on the international market as material for bags, shoes, wallets and other luxury items that hunters nearly drove the crocodiles to extinction. Nowadays, the trade is carefully controlled. Special farms breed crocodiles for their meat and their skins, playing a big part in the local economy. Hatched and bred in captivity, the young crocodiles are fattened up on a diet of fresh chicken. Although they could survive months in the wild without food, here they can eat up to two kilograms of meat per day. But at the age of two or three, their time is up. Crocodile meat is fat-free and tastes like chicken. But it's not what crocs taste like that grabs Rob Breddle, but what makes them tick. We have now seen a wild crocodile captured from the wild. I'm going to show you a tame crocodile that was hatched from the egg 16 years ago. And it's quite different. He's more dangerous. <laughs> this one's fat guts and he's a tame crocodile. I hatched him from an egg 16 years ago. But that makes him more dangerous than a wild one because he has no fear of me and he's larger than I am and he thinks I'm another crocodile. So when I go into the cage, I'm in his territory and because I don't smell or look like a female crocodile, I must be male. So he wishes then to chase me. That makes him more dangerous. You'll see when we go in, I can't get too close and then he will want to chase me. And then he will go into the water and I'll show you how the crocodile actually hunts. That's interesting. Now what you'll see here is as I get close to this crocodile, he will actually just spin around towards me straight away. And he wants to chase me because I'm in his territory now. The other one just sits down. Now he goes into the water. He will also go under the water. You'll see he can actually see me. 
He's following me around, but he won't come out. He's waiting for me to come in. So if an animal comes to the water for a drink, the crocodile waits for his dinner. He waits for it to come to him. This is the nature of the crocodile. So here, what we do is we leave the crocodile be a crocodile and just use his own instincts. That's all we do. So that makes it quite safe. Well, you watch what can happen. Oh, nearly got me. <laughs> well, what it is is if I am moving back when the crocodile comes towards me at the same moment, he looks good. It looks like he nearly got me. But it, I don't have to, because the crocodile he is reacting only to the splash. That's all he's reacting to. Now, some places will make the crocodile rush from the water. They starve the animal to do this. And I call it a guard dog crocodiles. They make dangerous situations with an animal that need not be. In fact, I believe crocodiles are a sensational enough animal without the bullshit. As you can see, he sits there and waits. An animal comes, puts its face in, bang, he's got it. That's it, finished. That's the real crocodile. Okay, this is Solomon, our largest crocodile. He's four and a half metres long and about 700 kilograms. And in fact, this is the size of crocodile that generally eats people in Australia, if you swim with him. Now, he's laying here and he looks like a great big piece of concrete. We'll show you he's alive. We'll just sit on him and he'll actually move for it. Come on, yeah, go on. <laughs> hey, get out, come on. <laughs> hey, big fella, yeah. That's all right, it's all right. I'll come around there and I'll give him some meat. By splashing, he thinks I'm in the water now, so he comes. And even though I'm here, if I splash over there, he will actually look at the splash, not for me. I'll take him up the other end and we'll feed him. Come on. What makes a crocodile so dangerous is that they can hold their breath for up to three hours. So if people come to a place where there's water and they stand here for a few minutes and see nothing, they think it's quite safe because people can't wait for three hours, but he can. Now, what you'll notice on every scale, there's a black spot. That's a pressure sensor. And on the mouth here, you can see there are many of these black spots on every scale. That allows him to feel anything splashing in the water from any part of his body turn, and because he's got many on his mouth, he can then pinpoint where it is. So he can get straight to it without ever seeing it. It's an excellent way of hunting. This is Snappy. And we call him Snappy because he doesn't bite. <laughs> and the reason he doesn't bite is because this crocodile I raised from a baby, and like if you keep a dog, the dog thinks that every person is another dog. So he thinks I'm another crocodile. And I'm 80 kilos, and he's only about six kilos. So if he was to bite me, then he's dead, because I would bite him back in real terms. So he doesn't bite for that reason. And that's why a tame crocodile becomes more dangerous, because when he gets bigger than me, at two to 300 kilos, then I'm a smaller crocodile. So it doesn't matter if I bite him, he bites me back, I'm dead. <laughs> Knowledge provides Rob with all the safety he needs. Safety is paramount back at Kakadu National Park, where Russell calls in the experts. It's time to start a few fires. This is my best friend here, Ollie. Um, he's the chief uh, district ranger for uh, Nalanji District. And he's pretty much an expert here when it comes to uh, lighting up fires. And uh, Ollie's got a few equipment here, which uh, basically he operates within, within uh, making up uh, or lighting fires. Russell, what we're going to do, mate, is we're going to start burning just at the, down at the other end down there. Yep. We're going to try and work sort of back into the wind a little bit. Yep. And, um, you know, basically just going to light up the edge with a drip torch. No worries, Ollie. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a better way of uh, actually lighting up fires than throwing matches out the door. <laughs> this may seem like strange behaviour, but there is a very good reason for deliberately lighting fires. 
Birds, what we're trying to do is to get rid of the dry undergrowth early in the year so that it doesn't cause huge fires late in the year, you know, when we get very hot and very dry conditions. This method of fighting fire with fire has been used by the Aboriginal people for thousands of years. There is nothing random or careless going on here. Fire control is an exact science, closely monitored so that it doesn't get out of hand. More than half of Kakadu National Park will be burnt like this mid-season. From the air, it looks like a disaster zone, but it's only the undergrowth that is torched. From a distance, the smoke billows out in a distinct managed pattern. Ollie doesn't take any chances though and stays with the fire all the time. It's the only way to prevent a natural disaster. It may look a little bleak right now, but in a few days time, the new green shoots will start pushing through. Before long, this charred landscape will be transformed into a fresh green wonderland. Russell and Melanie escape the heat and leave Ollie to get on with his job. Russell wants to show Melanie one of his favorite spots. It's a bit of a climb, but it's well worth the effort. So, you know, we, we get up to the top here and a lot of people look out there and say, bang, it hits you. Look at all this beautiful place, isn't it? A lot of people see it's very green, there's permanent water all around, and um, I suppose the breeze that hits you when you get up the top here makes you feel good too. And this fantastic view just hits them. And uh, very, Benning people are very proud to uh, be associated with this country. The same breathtaking views have inspired people for millennia. As far back as 50,000 years ago, people paid tribute to the beauty surrounding them. The Aboriginal people who once lived here at Abir Rock immortalized themselves by creating some of the finest examples of rock art. But they connect through these animals, they connect through uh, a lot of birds, um, insects in the country through this very special meaning of kinship. And that's why Benning people lived in this area. And it just so happens that nature's provided a very nice place to, to live in. Um, and if you were going to be anywhere else, you'd want to be in this lovely, cool, shaded spot away from the, the hot sun. And also, during wet season times, we have immense amount of water through here. I would rather be here than anywhere else. Russell feels passionate about this part of Australia. The view's fantastic, the feeling's great, and I suppose it's the spirit of the country. In the dusty outback, Anya's journey into the Aboriginal way of life continues. Maggie wants to take her to a place that holds great significance for them. Chambers Pillar. This solitary sandstone column towers 40 meters over the Simpson Desert. To the Aboriginal people, it represents a forefather who was burnt in the desert because he married a girl from the wrong clan. Rock art of a different kind shows how important Chambers Pillar was as a landmark for the early pioneers traveling from Alice Springs to Adelaide in the 1800s. Although much has changed since those days, both the scorching heat and the pestilent desert flies would have been a nuisance to travelers back then, too. Aboriginal people have thrived here for thousands of years. Today, their way of life is slowly dying out. Soon, the didgeridoo, or bull roarer, may be one of the few things left of a once vibrant culture. As the first settlers moved steadily inland, 
Aboriginal people began to lose their homelands and hunting grounds to farming and grazing ventures. Today, few Aboriginal people live the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle of their ancestors. Most now live in settlements like Tichikala, many of which are essentially slums. They're torn between two worlds, the modern Western way and their ancestral origins. The upheaval of the past two centuries has triggered a range of difficult social problems. An entire culture faces extinction. Tourism could help. It could help protect what's left of the unique Aboriginal culture, as well as generating income in poverty-stricken settlements. A few traditions still survive. The village men still know how to roast a kangaroo, which means first building an oven right there in the middle of the outback. They dig a hole in the ground and fill it with branches. Once lit, they let the oven preheat. The dish needs very little preparation before being tossed on whole to char, so that the juices are sealed in. Anya finds it difficult to watch. She's privileged, though, as women aren't usually allowed to participate in this ritual. Once the fire has died down, the men tuck the kangaroo into the hot ashes to roast slowly. And while the kangaroo roasts, Anya talks to the men about their way of life. They don't hunt much anymore. Like her, most of their meat now comes from the supermarket. They used to come out with a spear, with boomerangs, and come hunt for them. And they walk so far where them kangaroos are, they know where the kangaroos are. After about an hour, the meat is ready. Anya can't bring herself to eat any. It looks a bit rare. But the men know that overcooked kangaroo is as tough as leather, and they know what they're doing. These men may enjoy their kangaroo barbecued, but luckily for the kangaroos, most tourists and Australians prefer them alive and bouncy. Anya's long and exciting day finally draws to a close. She will treasure the experience for a lifetime, privileged to spend some time with people with such ancient cultural roots. The Aboriginal people are keen for others to know more about their culture and daily life. Rob Bredle wants people to discover Australia's wonderful wildlife. He was born into a family of animal lovers. Some people wonder why I know so much about animals. Well, my great-grandfather was a farmer in Austria, of all places, in Europe. And my father came to Australia in 1950, and he started one of Australia's first private zoos. So I've grown up with animals. In fact, between my father, my brothers, myself, my family, we have well over 200 years of what I call playing with creatures of the wild, wild animals. So we understand them. Rob owes his trademark bare feet to another formative experience. Okay, some people wonder why I go barefoot. Well, back in 1972, I lived with the Aborigines for 10 years to 1982, and I just threw my shoes away. I didn't like wearing shoes anyway. Rob has to watch where he steps, and not just for thorns and sharp stones. The brown snake can grow up to two meters long. One of Australia's most venomous snakes, its bite can kill an adult human in less than an hour. It hunts small animals, especially rodents, tracking them down by scent and stealth. Its victim knows nothing until it's too late. There is no escape. The snake's venom acts instantly, and its coils curl around in a deadly embrace. 
and the snake doesn't waste any time. No sooner is the prey dead than the snake swallows it whole. Rob feels as much at home with snakes as he does with crocodiles. He knows exactly how to handle this harmless, black-headed python. What a beauty. What a little beauty. Now, even though he doesn't look that big here, when I stretch him out, you'll see he's about two metres long. So he's a fairly big snake. And you'll see that the tongue is coming out quite often, and that is for tasting. Snakes can't see very well, they can't hear, so they find their food with the tongue. And the tongue is very sensitive. It actually rubs onto a special organ in the mouth called a Jacobson's organ. So it picks up little molecules of scent on the air or on the ground where the animals have walked, and it can then follow them. Amazing snake. I'll leave him now, and she can go hunting, and I'm sure she'll find something. OK, mate. You warm up in the sun. When you're out with Rob, you can be sure that the next sighting is only a few steps away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll give you one guess on the name of this lizard. <laughs> yes, it's called a blue tongue lizard. It's obvious, it's got a very blue tongue. Now he has to be very careful because the black-headed python likes to eat this one. And just like this one here uses his tongue to find his food, the python uses his tongue to find this food. Hey mate, I found something for you. Some food. The lizard also uses its tongue as a vivid warning to rivals. It's very tasty. He's having breakfast. <laughs> okay, now I'm happy and you're happy. Ta-da! <laughs> Rob then demonstrates how snakes will attack gotcha. only if provoked. Oopsie daisy, caught his head there. Okay. Yeah, it's a brown tree snake. Now, what's so special about this snake, even though he's only a little bit poisonous, he has got fangs in the back of his mouth. So if he bites you, he has to actually bite like this to get the fangs in. But it's not harmful to humans. Now, even though he's a, a wild snake, you'll notice if I let him move, he's not doing anything. But if I actually grab him like that, you'll see he comes around and he bites me. I have to make him bite me. If I let him go, he should let me go also. He's not letting go. <laughs> you see, he's trying to get the fangs in now. He's actually trying to get the fangs in. There he goes. But once I let him go, he lets me go too. Rob proves time and again that a healthy respect for animals, along with an understanding of their behavior, will keep you safe. He is also an experienced tracker, spotting signs that most people would miss. This looks interesting here. I can see there's some fresh earth. If we look up there, you can actually see in there is a kind of a frog, but it's not a frog. Ha! Look at that. Now, this is a very interesting little toad. It's not a frog, it's a toad. It's called a marine toad. Its Latin name is Bufo marinus. So this toad can actually live in a salt water environment, and he does. Now this toad was brought to Australia, it's not a native, to combat the cane beetle, but it became a pest because here on its neck is a venom gland, either side. And if something eats him, they die. You never know your luck, I'll kiss it. No, it didn't turn into a princess. No. <laughs> I'll put him back. <laughs> He won't want to kiss the next creature, a freshwater crocodile. At three metres long, it's almost half the size of a salty and a lot less dangerous, with a long and narrow snout. Rob has chosen a pristine bit of land for his eco-park. 
This lake will be the new home for his crocodiles. Instead of throwing facts and figures at people, Rob uses a very different technique to educate people about animals. By revealing why animals behave the way they do, he strips away the fear, replacing it with fascination. Come on. Come on. Here, that's just calling him. You can see the bubbles out there now, see in the front? You can see bubble coming. That's the crocodile coming towards us. Come on. And once you know what a crocodile does, you know exactly Come what on. it will do. Come on. But you see, he waits for us. We have to go to him. We wish to show people the truth about the environment in a common sense, logical way, so they can understand it. That's all we wish to, that's our aim, our goal. And to do this, we have this eco park, as you want to call it, where we keep animals as natural as possible and then explain to the people how the animal works. It's just so simple. For the koala Richie, the big day has finally arrived. It's time for him to broaden his horizons. This eucalyptus patch has been designed especially with koalas in mind. This koala has been in captivity for seven years now, in a small cage with the people. What we've done here is created a koala habitat. We're going to give him some freedom, but controlled freedom. What do you think, Richie? Your new home. Off you go. See you later. See you tomorrow. Richie sets off to do what koalas do, climb eucalyptus trees. And Rob carries on doing what he does best, infecting people with his enthusiasm, sharing his passion for the Northern Territory and its wildlife. Come on down under to Australia and experience our unique wildlife and our crazy characters. See you later. <laughs> with such huge spaces to care for, Australia's caretakers have their work cut out. The Northern Territory is already proud of its success stories and of how it looks after so many wonderful, exotic and fascinating animals. Visitors get a real taste of what it has to offer. From remote adventure and close-up wildlife encounters. To a chance to witness an ancient way of life. They won't forget the experience. And they certainly won't forget this ultimate journey.